is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello, welcome to Vio Africa. Thanks for joining us. I'm Douglas Mpuga, and here is what's coming up. We are here today to tell the world uh, that uh, we cannot keep silent for uh, this level of cruelty, raping women, killing them, attacking houses, making the life of the people very miserable. That's Inas Muzamil, who joined the protests in Sudan to express solidarity with the victims of gender-based violence. Also, a siege by militants at a hotel near the presidential palace in Mogadishu is over with eight civilians killed. Former Comoros President Ahmed Abdallah Sambi has been convicted of treason. And Ghana beat South Korea and Cameroon tied Serbia at the World Cup. All this and more coming up on African News Tonight. Today at the World Cup, Cameroon drew 3-3 with Serbia and Ghana beat South Korea 3-2. Ghana's chances are slightly better than Cameroon's, but the Black Stars must win their remaining group match against Uruguay to qualify for the knockout stage. My colleague Jackson Mvungani is in Accra, Ghana, and joins me now. Hello, Jackson. Hello, Douglas. How are you doing? I'm really good, thank you. Great, great. Jackson, what an entertaining game and the wonderful goals. What was the reaction of the fans over there? Absolutely. Lots of celebrations here in Accra, Douglas. People are celebrating, dancing on the streets, cars honking. Life is just on a standstill, I mean, any, everybody seems to be, like, really plugged into this game. Uh, and they needed this game. They needed this win. Ghana came out swinging in this match, and they needed to win this if they were to have any hopes of advancing past the group stages. And you can tell that people are a little relieved after that loss to Portugal last week. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you, you, you can feel like there's been a change in the mood uh, that they know that, you know, coming on Friday, that you know, crucial game with, with Uruguay, that they do stand a chance of winning it. Yes, uh, Jackson. Talking of Uruguay, Ghana, as you say, has to win the last group game uh, to qualify. They play Uruguay. They have a history in the World Cup. What are Ghanaians <laughs> saying about that? Listen, Ghanaians have never forgotten, forgotten that moment with Suarez denying them the chance to advance to the semifinals, and they are looking forward. I think this is the game that they are looking forward to more than anything else for so that revenge against uh, Uruguay. Uh, and you know. They have proven, proven right now, the Black Stars have proven that they have what it takes to win. Uh, and going into Friday, they, not, they have that boost of confidence, and sometimes that is what you need. Uh, it will make up for any, any lack of, uh, 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 of strategy or skill, and, and honestly, you can feel like they have the confidence. Speaking to them on the streets today, many said, Suarez, they're coming for you. I see. Well, talking of confidence, earlier today, Cameroon drew with Serbia 3-3. It was a very uh, good match, too. Did many Ghanaians watch that, yes. too, and uh, African Absolutely. pride that work? You know, the, 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 Ghanaian game, the, the Ghanaian game came right after Cameroon, so you could tell there was tension already in the city when they, they were waiting for the Black Stars to take on South Korea. Some of them watched. Some of them did not. They were, you know, moving to these uh, sta- uh, centers where they watched the game. But you know what, Douglas? Cameroon proved that, that they are indeed the indomitable Lions for a reason. You know, they were already counted out by those two goals. But those two goals by uh, Victor were the game changer for sure. And, you know, here in, in, in Ghana, whenever an African team plays, everybody's supporting and, and so, you know, for some who were able to make it to the game, they were very happy and they're encouraged. They think that, you know, maybe this is Africa's World Cup after all. That's right. That's the African spirit, Jackson. Uh, take care for now. Thank you very much, Douglas. You're welcome. Somali security forces say eight civilians were killed in a siege by Al-Shabaab militants at a popular hotel in the capital Mogadishu. A national police spokesman a short time ago said the security forces had taken control of the Villa Reis Hotel and rescued the 60 civilian hostages. 
Earlier, Somali media reported the country's federal security minister and a deputy defense minister were wounded in the siege at the hotel, which is near the presidential palace. Al-Shabaab militants attacked the hotel Sunday evening. The attack comes after the federal government said the Somalia's military had killed hundreds of Al-Shabaab militants since the start of an operation against the terrorist group in July. At least 100 people were killed in twin bombings in Mogadishu in late October. Al-Shabaab claimed responsibility for the attacks. A court in Comoros, the island nation of Mozambique, has found former President Ahmed Abdallah Sambi guilty of treason for selling passports to people from the Middle East. Mohamed Yusuf reports from VOA's Africa News Centre in Nairobi, Kenya. A state security court in Comoros gave a life sentence to former President Ahmed Abdallah Sambi. Sambi is charged with treason and the court said it found him guilty of selling Comorian passports to people in Gulf countries. The 64-year-old was not present in the court. He boycotted the hearing last week, claiming he will not get a fair trial. John Ferryman is a lawyer representing Sambi. He termed the trial and the ruling illegal. The case should have been stopped. If the case went on, at least it should have been brought before a regularly court established according to the law, which was not the case. If it was brought before a regular court established according to the law, then it's obvious for me that President Sambi should be, have been acquitted because there is actually not even a piece of evidence. Sambi has spent four years in jail for corruption. The prosecution said the former president embezzled millions of dollars for the sale of passports to foreigners. Fairmont says they will take the case to the International Forum to seek justice for Sambi. We'll have to take this to the international scene. There is no other choice than to take this out of the commerce and try to get on the international scene uh, attention for this case. Uh, with the UN bodies in Geneva, with the French justice system to which we will submit the question of this uh, attempt to actually buy a false witness statement, because formally there is no poss- possibility to appeal the decision under uh, Comorian law. There's no other choice than to uh, go beyond the Comores to uh, continue the struggle for justice for uh, President Sambi. One of the defendants, Bashar Kiwan, a French-Syrian businessman, accused the current Comorian government led by President Azali Osomani of pressuring him to testify against Sambi in exchange for a pardon. The presidency denies the claim. Sambi, after leaving power, was placed under house arrest for disturbing public order. He ruled the Indian Ocean nation from 2006 to 2011. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. Sudanese women protested outside UN offices in Khartoum yesterday as part of a campaign against gender-based violence. The protesters called for better protection of women and children in Sudan's conflict areas and for justice and accountability. Sudan's head of combating violence against women admits that gender-based violence has increased in many parts of the country due to a lack of law enforcement. Michael Atit reports from Khartoum, Sudan. Scores of Sudanese women, most dressed in black and holding black banners, protested outside UN offices calling on Sudan's military rulers to better protect women and give power to the people. They condemned violence used against women across Sudan and in recent unrest in the Blue Nile, Kaudufan, and Darfur regions. Hala al karib heads the Sudan office for the Strategic Initiative for Women in the Horn of Africa, or SIHA. She says thousands of women are being killed, raped, and displaced across Sudan, and the military is failing to hold the culprits accountable. What's happening is very, very scary. And the losses among women and children, the destructions of the infrastructure, destructions of the schools, particularly in Lagawa area, what happened in Blue Nile with the ethnic conflicts between the communities, the promotion of the hate language, all these are concerns for us as women groups. The UN in Sudan in October expressed concern at renewed intercommunal fighting in Blue Nile and West Kordofan that left at least 170 people dead and 300 wounded. The UN in a statement said at least 1,200 households were displaced 
and call for an end to the violence and for protection of women and children. Inas Muzamil joined the protest to express solidarity with the victims of violence. We are here today to tell the world uh, that uh, we cannot keep silent for uh, this level of cruelty, raping women, killing them, attacking houses, making the life of the people very miserable. The Sudanese women were protesting for a campaign called 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence, or GBV. They handed over a petition to the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights in Khartoum, urging them to enforce justice. A UN worker accepted the petition, but a spokesperson did not immediately comment on it. Suleyma al-Khalifa is head of combating violence against women at Sudan's Ministry of Social Development. He's speaking to VOA Monday, she admits her office has seen an increase in violence and injustice against women. The lack of governance created this kind of lack of accountability and even we lost the coordination mechanism we used to have. We had tried our best to visit places where there is conflict and we tried to look out how we could find a solution. But actually, the increasing of the gender-based violence and some cases of femicide, most of these cases are not well documented. Activist Al-Karib also retreated calls in Sudan for a return to civilian rule in the country for great accountability. It's really crucial for the international community to understand that the demands of Sudanese for civilian government is legitimate and the demands of Sudanese women of peace and security, it's up 100% legitimate and their voices should be considered in any process. Sudan has seen near weekly protests against military rule since an October coup last year overthrow a transitional government. Political and military backed groups have since been negotiating to form a fresh transitional authority until elections can be held. Michael Atid for VOA News, Khartoum, Sudan. You are listening to Africa News Tonight. I'm Douglas Impoga in Washington. For more information on these and other stories from the continent, please see voaafrica.com. There you'll find all your favorite VOA radio and TV programs and a whole lot more. For world news, check out voanews.com. Rescue workers in Cameroon's capital Yaoundé are searching for people believed trapped under a landslide that killed at least 14 people and injured scores more Sunday. The victims were attending a funeral when the landslide occurred. Moki Edwin Kinzika reports from Yaoundé. Civilians mourn as they join rescue workers in digging and searching for people they fear are trapped underneath a huge pile of debris. The soil and stones collapsed Sunday evening on several hundred community members from Cameroon's west region who had gathered for a funeral of people who died within the past month. 50-year-old Rosette Ngefak is among the mourners. She says she saw the ground collapse on scores of people, including her two sons. Il a fendu la tête et cassé la main. On était à l'hôpital général. On a fait le scanner. Gefak says she is still searching for her 24-year-old son, who was buried by the landslide alongside his motorcycle. She says she left the Yaoundé Central Hospital at 2 a.m. after hospital staff reassured her that. Her 21-year-old son, also a victim of the landslide, is responding to treatment. It is a tradition in Cameroon for communities to organize funeral events in towns after burial of their community members in villages. People who attended the funeral prior to the landslide said they had prayed for the departed and were sharing drinks and food when the unfortunate incident occurred. Nasiri Paul Beya, governor of Cameroon's central region, where Yaoundé is located, visited the disaster site for the second time within 15 hours on Monday morning. He says that investigations carried out by Cameroon police indicate that 
some civilians are still trapped in the landslide. Bea says he asked the government for more troops to assist rescue workers who, for the past 14 hours, have been searching for people. He says bodies removed from the disaster site are identified by the police and taken to the mortuary of the central hospital in Yaoundé and then eventually to their family members. Cameroon's government says the landslide occurred when an 18-meter-high embankment collapsed on several hundred civilians attending a funeral in a house constructed in a risky area. Bayer said the embankment that gave way was not solid enough to stop the soil from collapsing. Cameroon's housing ministry Monday asked people living in areas deemed at risk of landslides to immediately leave or be forced to relocate. Yaoundé, a city of about 3 million people, has had devastating floods caused by heavy rains within the past three months. The government says more than 25 houses constructed in risky areas have collapsed, injuring and killing scores of people. Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News, Yaoundé, Cameroon.